So, um, I'm here to talk about um, what we're calling the QuantStamp Assurance Protocol. I guess I should introduce myself too. So, yes, I'm Stephen Stewart. I'm, I'm the CTO, co founder of QuantStamp. Um, prior to that, I, um, uh, I'm a computer scientist. And I, I guess I guess I'm a PhD dropout. I don't like admitting it, uh, but it seems to be the cool thing to say. Um, I noticed that Remco from Zero X, uh, one profile for him is his PhD dropout. Um, I prefer to, you know, think I'm going to go back and finish it. But QuantStamp got too busy for me, so last April I became a PhD dropout. Um, but I was studying at the University of Waterloo, uh, working with. Um, uh, Professor Derek Rayside uh, using graphics processors um, for um, accelerating the operations of something called a SAT solver. It's a tool used in uh, uh, formally verifying, well, as an example, I mean, there are many applications, but one, one application in software engineering is for formal verification of software. Of course, the word formal implying Mathematics, mathematical rigor, verification, meaning ch checking that certain properties hold, being able to prove that they do. Um, and um, so uh, Richard Ma and myself, we created QuantStamp. Um, goodness, I'm, I can't keep track of the time, when was it? Back in 2017. And we had in common um, uh, an interest in the idea of securing code, um, Richard's background was in high frequency trading and he was uh, quite familiar with um, all of the testing and, and rigor that goes into that because if uh, your strategy has, you know, if your code implementing your strategy has a bug, it can have a catastrophic effect. Um, and, I, and, and so the two of us sort of both had this interest and he also um, contributed to the DAO. So, oh, you'll see. so we have these slides that we always show, but I feel like it's getting dated now. I can just want to check a second here. Um, so <laughs> everyone remembers the DAO. By the way, these slides are Jan Gorsny's. I've crossed his name out. Um, uh, so uh, I will probably stumble a little bit through these because I don't normally present them. Um, but Jan is a blockchain researcher and he, he would normally be doing this. So there's lots of motivation for caring about security. I think most people already know about that. And um, given the situation where once you deploy your code, it's immutable, then as noted here, when you're thinking about contract security, you usually think about pre-deployment options. Um, so your conventional kind of testing, um, auditing, so Quantstamp, we do we actually do code audits as a service, uh, formal verification, bug bounties. Um, I always have this sort of uh, conflict with the word security. Um, uh, it's you know sometimes we're talking about bugs. There can be a bug in your code, but it's not necessarily a security issue. Um, we use these words kind of very loosely at times, even though I think you know, terms like security do require precise definitions, but I've kind of taken a look at some of the literature and I see a lot of different definitions for computer security. Um, yeah, but anyhow, um, my, my background is in uh, more informal verification and parallel computing, and um, I, it took me some time to get used to kind of the branding of QuantStamp as a security company. Are we doing security or are we doing software engineering? Turns out we're doing security. So my co-founder was right about that. And so, um, and then there's this notion of continuous security. Um, so begging the question, you deploy your code, how can it be protected against new attacks? Maybe you've already done everything you could possibly do, your code is just absolutely perfect at that moment in time something changes in the future, I don't know, the, the EVM changes, and um, someone discovers that you can now do a new re-entry exploit. Things like that can happen. Um, so QuantSamp is interested in this idea of continuous security, which is basically, um, internally we call it monitoring, basically 
observing a smart contract while it's live and alerting, uh, creating alerts if there's unusual behavior. That's, um, so there's some examples of what can be done there. I'll skip through that because that's not really what I'm looking to talk about. Okay, so security assurance. So that's assurance, it starts with an A, um, like quality assurance. Um, it's this notion of uh, somehow being able to assure uh, uh, the, the, let's say the owner or the stakeholder of a, a smart contract, if you will, um, that their code is secure and won't get hacked. Um, and so we have these, these two um, actors um, in the assurance protocol. One is the stakeholder and the other is the security expert. So the stakeholder wants their code to be correct. If something bad happens, they might lose funds, digital assets, and the security expert uh, who wants to get paid for her skills, for her expertise, and also has some funds available. So, um, so, um, so Jan does a nice job of creating these visual slides. It's nice. Um, so, as you can see here, the stakeholder, just as it says, has some amount of money um, that he or she is uh, willing to compensate, sorry, wants as much money to compensate for exploited contract. And then we have the security expert who wants to audit the code and get paid for it. So these, this is the scenario we, be, we begin with. The security expert is so confident in his auditing skills that he says, you know what, I'm willing to stake some of my own funds, um, you know, put my reputation and my money on the line, um, and I'll, I'll stake a certain amount to, cl to claim that the contract is correct. Now, why would I, why would I do that? Well, um, and, and why would somebody, so this is the slide showing, and somebody else could too. So not just a security expert, but anybody in the world, they could just say, yeah, I guess 10 security experts have gone in and said, this contract looks good, maybe I'll go in too. Well, what does going in mean? We'll see, we'll see momentarily, but I'm talking about um, the staking of funds, and what would incentivize you to do that? Well, the stakeholder um, pays for this. So it's kind of like, uh, uh, um, what would you call it, like a premium kind of, Payout. So the stakeholder pays for the stake periodically, um, provided that the contract is not exploited. Because if it's exploited, then the security expert uh, actually didn't, you know, didn't. There's something that he he didn't find, and so maybe I lose funds. So, um, so that's exactly what it says here. Um, so I'm a stakeholder. I said, and I say, okay, um, my funds or somehow my contract was exploited. Actually, more generically, whether it's funds or something else that you might imagine, um, namely, there is some policy or some conditions that are, um, uh, that do not hold. And as a result, uh, I want to claim um, these funds. So as I said, from the security expert perspective, these are these funds are lost if the contract is exploited. Okay, let me clarify. So the security expert and someone else, they're staking funds, and they want to do that because they're getting paid by the stakeholder. But as soon as something bad happens to the stakeholder's contract, then the stakeholder claims uh, what the security expert and others have staked. I hope that was clear. And then. Um, so this timeline simply it shows the sequence of events that would happen here. Contract is deployed. Um, potentially, um, you'll see it says down here the QSP network report is published. Um, I actually just realized it didn't really tell you much about Quantstamp, so I, I don't know how much you know, but um, we've been, we're building out the QSP network, um, which is a way of sourcing compute power to do formal verification or to do um, uh, code audits, automated code audits. Um, so one potential step here is that an automated audit is done, so it sort of ticks off that checkbox, and then 
you see the top first page of introduce funds, and there's a bunch of details there. Um, actually, it gets quite complicated. We have uh, extremely detailed diagrams on our internal uh, wiki, um, and too much to go into uh, for this. And I don't know what that slide is for. Um, and so, obvious question is, well, what is an exploit? So this question is being posed because we want to know um, when can the stakeholder claim to have um, uh, suffered damages and can claim what was uh, staked. Um, so, uh, so as it says here, um, it's up to the stakeholder to define the bad behavior, it's up to the staker to watch for back doors. So basically, the, the stakeholder at the very beginning, um, let me see here if we get into that, defining exploits, um, defines the conditions. Um, I believe we call this policy. Yeah, we call this policy. Um, and basically, this says so. Here's, a, for example, this function. This is obviously a trivial example, but uh, in the body of this, let's see here. Uh, basically, it says, oh, if the balance goes to zero, that indicates this is this has been hacked. Um, I think you can probably imagine scenarios where you know balance going to zero doesn't mean it was hacked. Maybe. There was a deliberate reason why it went to zero. This is just a, a toy example. Um, and actually, our team is working on um, creating a set of uh, predefined policies that people can use. But you can probably imagine it can get fairly complicated. Um, I actually was pushing for this idea. Um, um, this, this, you know, alternatively, um, you could consult an oracle to verify that as some event occurred, so that, that's been identified as another uh, possibility. I like the idea of being able to actually define uh, the policy as a contract, as a smart contract, and that's defined up front, and then the security experts, who are supposed to be experts in reviewing code, they can read the policy. If they're comfortable with it, um, then they're willing to, to stake their own funds. Now, you can also imagine, maybe I'm really clever and I somehow <laughs> write this obfuscated policy, make it really complicated, actually I have my own back door and I'm actually trying to get the funds that are staked. You know, there's lots of scenarios. We've talked through you know, dozens of different uh, scenarios that could happen. Um, but, but I've always said, um, uh, if you agree to the policy, you agree to the policy. So uh, actually what I say uh, in the company is fire beware. So I've kind of pushed for this. We'll, we'll see how this, um, how this works out. Um, so I guess, I guess this slide is just emphasizing, yeah, stakeholder with a smart contract um, and a policy and contract addresses and terms. Uh, I apologize, I don't quite know what this slide is. Contract addresses in terms. Sorry about that. I don't recall what Yon had in mind there. Um, just this is just another uh, high-level representation of the same thing. So it's just a uh, with a system perspective. So we have a lot of these diagrams. Um, so arguably. Um, uh, so you'll see that the slide is titled staking, um, and arguably, and really what it, was, it probably should be just um, titled assurance. So this idea of security assurance uh, arguably enables uh, or helps to scale verification. This is, could be, we could discuss that, but by providing a marketplace for auditors, so code experts and others to stake collateral as a claim on the contract security, um, and avoid fraudulent reports. So, um, since checks are automatic and rational actors won't stake on insecure contracts or policies which can be gamed by stakeholders. Um, I think what Jan was getting at here, since checks are automatic and rational actors won't stake on insecure contracts or policies. Um, so I, I, I actually don't remember what he's referring to here for reports. 
But I think this is about where I'm saying, I got earlier I said you can kind of game this, you can imagine a stakeholder even gaming it. Um, but a rational actor who studies the code and understands it, they're not going to um, stake collateral if they know um, there's a, you know, some kind of backdoor or vulnerability. So. Um, so the summary here, uh, basically looping back to the beginning, the idea that um, post-deployment we can do some kind of continuous <coughs> monitoring of a smart contract. Um, I kind of compare this, so a few years ago I, I worked at a startup company called MapD and we were using GPUs, uh, in-memory GPU databases to do this really fast um, millisecond querying of gigabytes of data. Actually, um, we were, I was thinking maybe, I, uh, we were talking to big fintech companies, I'm not sure if I can actually name, name them, it's been a few years, I probably can, um, who were interested in fraud detection. Um, so it's kind of similar, basically, looking at uh, certain transactions that trigger alarms, certain patterns of behavior um, that would uh, you know, to trigger a security incident. And then uh, the staking, uh, which again is referring to the security assurance idea, um, just as another uh, sort of, uh, another post-deployment uh, approach to not quite securing, um, but hopefully offering assurance, increasing confidence in the security of that contract. Um, and that's, that's the presentation. Yes? Uh, so, I was wondering, if I was, if this existed, and I saw that a great smart <coughs> expert put a little bit of, or put some amount of, if, if I was watching and I saw that a very smart security expert put down, say, one ether on a contract, then could I, a non-security expert, then put down 10 ether and then get paid 10 times more than the actual expert? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I think the way we've designed this, so there, there are, um, I, I don't have um, all the details of the protocol, um, but I'm pretty sure the way, um, there, there's, uh, it's designed to um, offer greater benefit to actual security experts and to incentivize them to participate. There's a, a what's called a TCR, a token curated registry, that will uh, maintain the list of, uh, I guess, accredited security experts. Um, but uh, I don't have the exact detailed answer to your, to your question. So, uh, but I, I can find out. Is there a minimum staking period, or can the security researcher of a choice stake at every time? Sorry, what, what was that? Can the security expert withdraw his stake at every time, or is there a minimum staking period so it uh, cannot be withdrawn? Uh, there, are, there are minimum periods. So actually, um, we have been developing a user interface, so I forgot. Um, I still have uh, these to show you. And you'll see things in here. I, I, I realize the text is small for you, but um, so this is defining what we call a pool. Um, so, uh, and the stakeholder, uh, so the, the pool, of course, just refers to the pool of state um, funds for assuring the contract. And then there are all these different um, details that define how the payment works, the when, um, uh, payment, uh, payment periods, all these different things. Um, and expressed in terms of number of blocks. So there's minimum staking time. Um, there's, yeah, so there's, there's quite a bit there. Um, let me see. So this, this is supposed to be the stakeholder's view. And then there's the staker control as well. And um, this, this is um, a prototype uh, at the moment. So if you're a staker, you can stake your funds. You can withdraw, um, and there, you see actually in this, I think the withdraw stake button looks like, to me, it's like faded because at that moment, uh, they're not eligible to withdraw. Um, so 
there, there, are, there are a lot of de details that have gone into this. Um, I'm afraid I don't have them all committed to memory, but we do handle uh, that, that idea. Yeah. And one more question, if you allow. Um, what do you expect the ratio between stake and reward basically to be? So when stake and what? Stake and reward. So you get reward when you stake, right? So um, oh, what do you think? What's the ratio? Like when do you have your money back, basically? That's a great question too. And so I don't know the answer. And what we're doing is we're running uh, simulations. Um, so um, uh, Sebastian, uh, one of our senior researchers, he's actually. Um, actually in Munich. I was hoping he could come because he knows this inside out. Um, he's, um, he's currently building this uh, agent reinforce, reinforcement learning simulation uh, with uh, an objective function to maximize the end balance uh, for the uh, stakers and we're developing that right now and then we're also doing um, a community, uh, a quant stamp community involved um, test trial of our current prototype and this is going to help us to uh, get more precise answers to your question. Yeah, hope that makes sense. And so we're still uh, very much, still very much a work in progress. Um, yeah. Do we have some more questions? Um. Uh, the way how you define whether there was an exploit or not, um, if you try to encode this in smart contract, uh, it, it seems like it will be very, very complex smart contract, and I'm not even sure that it's possible to to check whether like check every situation. But even for every situation that you can think of, you will create a smart contract that will ch verify. Um, and it, it seems that like this new smart contract, which will verify whether there was exploit or not, it, it also needs an audit, you know. So this is like, this smart contract can be even more complex who, who, than... Who will audit? Who will audit? If I'm willing to stake my own funds, I'm a security expert, for example. That's yeah. on me. This yeah, is what yeah, I yeah, say. Yeah. I always say fire beware. This is what I tell our engineers. Yeah, as a security expert, you're right. But as the owner of the product or user of the product, you, you actually do the audit for the users of the product. And these users cannot be like sure that this product is safe just because these security experts, they know that they are doing what, uh, what they want. So the security experts are safe because you cannot like, uh, uh, you cannot find exploit that will, uh, uh, that will allow the security I expert to lose incentivizing, money. Incentivizing experts to put time, put their own funds, and hopefully get paid um, is, is a way to create greater confidence. That's why we use the word assurance. Um, greater confidence in the security of the smart contract. Um, I'm not saying this is perfect, um, and I. Obviously, like the policy could be very complicated. It could be as easy. It could be as simple as if the balance goes below whatever, um, then you know condition met. It could be that simple, or it could be very complicated. That's possible as well. And I, I agree. Um, you would you probably want to have professionals audit the policy as well, because maybe you have a nefarious um, uh, or a malicious security expert who sees a flaw in the policy and they don't tell you. Because they actually want to exploit it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, you can. Yeah, your question. So, do you believe that the system is better than paying the security experts directly? Oh, I don't. I don't have the data to to indicate that. Um, this needs to be, you know, tested and actually used in practice to find to get an answer to that question. Uh, yeah. and, and also, who's supposed to like uh, write this uh, smart contract that verifies whether there was an exploit? Is it who, who's supposed to use it? Is it supposed to write it or use it? Oh, uh, write it, write it. So it's complicated contract, and uh, yeah, who's supposed to write it? Someone who owns the product. Somebody who knows how to write smart contracts. <laughs> who whoever wrote the smart contract being secured potentially. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not sure, actually I'm not sure where you're going with the question. Yeah, I, I mean, whether you provide the service of uh, writing this kind of contracts. Who, sorry, who provides the service? The Quantstamp. Uh, we don't, no, we don't provide, uh, we don't author smart contracts as a service. We don't do that. Okay, thanks. No, we do, we do auditing, but we don't, uh, we don't write smart contracts. Perhaps a silly question, one that follows from that is like, could there then not be a flaw in the agreement itself? Yeah, there could be. Yeah. Buyer beware. <laughs> We spent a lot of time thinking about ways we could gain this. Um, and there definitely could be ways. Um, but the policy is a very important part. You, know, you obviously have to get it right. But hey, you could um, uh, you know, use the security assurance protocol to stake on the policy. <laughs> so is this going to be our product? It, it, it is a, yeah, it will be, um, a it will be in a test state. Uh, for the foreseeable future, and we would hope to see it become uh, a product that we share with the community. So it won't be it won't be like a, something that you sell. It's just going to be something independent. No, yeah, no, it's not a product we'll be we will be selling. It's a we'll be designed to um, uh, use our token interacting with our um, automated audits. Um, so. Although it doesn't have to be, someone could certainly, um, you know, fork the code and, and use it in a different way. Uh, but it's something where we, that you know, one of the one of our aims is to build utility for our token for our token holders. A very uh, something we, uh, it's an important responsibility that we have. So there are various um, R and D projects that we work on to that end. This is one of the more mature projects, but it's still still early. Anybody else? Yeah, I had one more small question. So uh, imagine a one a security exit already uh, did an audit, and then comes a second and finds a flow there. Do you do you plan to penalize the first security expert already at that time because they didn't find the flow, or you will have to wait until the contract is exploited? I never thought about that. Okay. Pun punishing this. So punishing uh, somehow. Um, <laughs> I'll have to think about that scenario. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I, I really appreciate uh, your questions, and um, feel free to reach out if you have any more questions or ideas um, to help us out. Um, Quantstamp.com. So thanks a lot. Thank you.